Uh, can you believe we sailed all the way to Windsor from Nova Scotia on an 18th century frigate? Yeah, even though that's not possible, especially the 18th century frigate. Well, it sure is nice to get back so we can record some hardcover. Yeah. Hey, did it just cloud over? Um, uh, yeah. Should we go below deck? What is that? What just happened? Um, return fire? How did we get a crew? We're coming alongside their ship. They're shooting at us. Quick, read to them from this book. Treasure Island. Okay. Fifteen men on a dead man's... They're boarding us! Chest! Yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of... Chest! Yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of... The book! Forget the book, you remember it! Uh... Uh... Rum! A bottle of rum! You did it! Technically, Robert Louis Stevenson did, but okay. What just happened? We may never know. Welcome to Hardcover. I'm Peter Bryn. She's Brittany Bryn. And this is Nobody Minds Ben Gunn. Dead or alive, nobody minds Ben Gunn. I mind Ben Gunn. I love Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn is one of my favorite characters in that book. It's true. He... What, what book is it? Oh, oh, maybe maybe it's that book I lost on the ship. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It just fell overboard, lost <laughs> forever. But we should we should talk about the book and Ben Gunn because Ben Gunn appears like pretty much halfway through, but yeah. he's one of the best characters. Woo. There's even a band called the Ben Gunn Society, <laughs> and their songs are about different parts of Treasure Island that Ben Gunn is in. What awesome! Yes, oh, I need to listen to it. That's really cool. Yeah, Treasure Island is so influential. It spawned so many films and uh, theater adaptations even. It's been um, reimagined, rehashed many, many times from The Muppets to Alvin and the Chipmunks to Orson Welles even doing a, doing a radio drama of it. And there's, mean, a, there's a Wishbone version of it too. I loved Wishbone. Was there uh, a Wishbone of Treasure Island? There was a Wishbone. It, oh, wow. it was called Salty Dog or something. Oh, well, Our. I mean, obviously it's a dog, right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Treasure Island is so influential, um, just basically on not even just North American culture, but the world in the way we think about pirates. Yeah. Like, we picture a pirate. We picture, you know, somebody with like the patch over one eye. And they're saying "r" a lot. They say like "ahoy, matey" and all this stuff. So, a lot of that vernacular comes from not not the book. Like it's not it's not really in the book, but in the movie, in like the nineteen fifty movie Treasure Island is where the actor who's playing Long John Silver threw in all these R's and Ahoy Mateys and stuff like that. And that's it caught on so so massively that that's what we think pirates are. Did you know the nineteen fifties version uh was done by Disney and it was their first full length live action film in color? Was, Whoa. was their adaptation of Treasure Island in nineteen fifty. Oh. The 1950 adaptation wasn't the first film adaptation, but it is probably the most well-known. The first one was done in 1918. It was a silent film um, by Fox. And then 1934 was the first talkie adaptation, the first film with talking done by MGM. And then the Disney version in 1950. Let's talk about the book. Yes, let's, let's talk about this book by Robert Louis Stevenson. Like Charles Dickens, he wrote Treasure Island as a serialized novel. So between 1881 and 1882, um, chapters of the book appeared in Young Folk magazine. <laughs> Young Folk magazine. <laughs> <laughs> under the pseudonym Captain George North. And mm. eventually all the chapters were collected and published in 1883. 
So that gives you kind of an idea of when this book was around. Um, it was definitely influenced by two different kind of sea genres that were popular at the time. One was an, the Navy yarn, so very traditional historical stories that were based in um, the Navy, usually around a captain who was very moral and uh, adventurous. And then the desert island romance genre, which could be traced back to uh, Robinson Crusoe, which was the original desert island adventure story. And you can trace that to other books such as The Coral Island, mm -hmm. which was in 1858. And it was about three teenage boys that were stranded on an island. And it was about Christian morality and the civilizing influence of European culture. And then Coral Island also influenced a uh, modern desert island story, Lord of the Flies, which kind of takes that theme of boys on an island where the European influence isn't civilizing and human nature is at its base corrupt. And even today we can see stories like this, um, for example, The Martian. You could consider that a desert romance almost because it is about someone who's stranded on a planet or an island apart from civilization and how he copes with being alone on that planet. So it, it, it's, it's a really interesting genre in how it's grown and how it is still relevant today. For sure. Um, one, of the, one of the coolest aspects of Treasure Island is it's a story that's, that's been around so much. It's just so ingrained in our culture. Hey, we just watched like a, a BBC take on, on, the, on Treasure Island like it was a two-part miniseries we watched. And Ben Gunn is played by Elijah Wood. Um, and it was great. It was a lot of fun. Like Donald Sutherland was uh, Captain Flint. Oh, yeah, Eddie Izzard was in that, like, you know, he was Long John. It was really cool, um, but what I liked uh, a, a lot about it is uh, the way they, they changed up the ending. They made the ending something fresh, something new, uh, because that's not the way it ends in the book. For sure. Um, and, you know, I will point out that the statue of limitations on Treasure Island is probably passed, so if you get a spoiler from this episode, we're sorry. I, lo I loved that adaptation because it was very true to the book. You could definitely see the influence and um, many of the lines of dialogue were taken directly from the book. So Jim Hawkins and uh, Long John Silver have a really unique relationship that I think um, really respected the book. But there's also a subplot that's added, which I thought was interesting because originally when Robert Louis Stevenson wrote this book, he said that it was a book for, for young boys and that's why women were absent. So he wrote this book mostly... Uh, populated by men and what growing up as a man in um, this story means. So the mother appears for like the first bit of the book, but then isn't really mentioned again. Mm -hmm. um, Long John Silver's wife is mentioned a couple times, but she never appears in the book. So they are they are present in the book, but they're never focused on their, ne their stories are never developed. Um, Jim Hawkins even has kind of a almost a dislike for his mother in some ways for the things that she does. He th he sees it as weakness when she goes back to the inn to take money from the chest that is owed to her. Whereas the doctor, Dr. Livesey, who's kind of one of the moral characters in the book, um, commends her for doing so. So we have this, this strange attitude from Jim and he, he's not really sad when he leaves home and there's no real homecoming at the end of the book. But in the miniseries, um, Jim Hawkins' mother and Long John Silver's wife are both both characters that have a story that connect, much like Long John and Jim's stories connect, um, in a really interesting way. And so they their subplot is present in that narrative. And then at the end, there is that kind of sense of homecoming. Like Long John goes back to his wife. They meet. It's 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 happy because in spite of everything, like they're still together, and that's the important thing. And Jim and his mother are reunited as well. And so I think the producers and the writers of that miniseries were really questioning the way that Robert Louis Stevenson was was looking at boyhood and what it means to become a man or become an adult and still including um, that important um, female figure or other figure. We also have to point out that, uh, I mean, this is a modern take on it, right? Like this, this came out in 2012. Yeah, absolutely. So there is no real room for... Uh, dismissing these kind of things, and maybe maybe the women did have a story to tell, and maybe this is the time that they get to tell it. Yeah, I and I thought that was great. Um, some critics did not receive the um, the changed storyline at the end, not just with um, the added subplot, but the characters' attitudes towards the treasure. Um, Jim ends up throwing the treasure overboard. 
Ben Gunn stays on the island because he's seen the corrupting influence of this gold on, um, for example, for example, on the Squire who oh, becomes corrupted no, by greed. Squire Trelawney. Yes, yes. Squire Trelawney is a terrible character in the movie, and in the book, he's kind of like, oh yeah, he's okay. Like, but actually, actually, yeah. In the book, he even has you know um, the upper hand a lot of the time. Like, they trust him and they give him they let him take point and they they give like he's the best marksman because he's trained in the british navy and he has um a really good kind of place in the book where in the show it's sort of a this miniseries we're talking about it's sort of like he's that laughed at character who's just obsessed with the treasure and he's such a hypocrite. Mm-hmm. He like there's scenes where he's praying aloud and he's like, "Oh, help me like on this mission and stuff." But then he he murders a man because this one pirate punched him and so his honor and his ego were bruised and so he had him keelhauled and then he died. The pirate died. And Squire Trelawney feels all, you know, like justified and everything while Jim is watching horrified at this kind of humanless law that is taking over on this ship. And so Jim's choice between the pirates and between um, the upstanding moral, um, I, I suppose, authority figures on the ship, that choice becomes more difficult because he has to choose between hypocrites and cowards um, and the charismatic um, yet violent life of a pirate. So for Jim in the miniseries, I thought that that decision between the two sides for him was a lot, there's a lot more at stake there for him than there was in the book because clearly he's going to go with the moral choice in the book, even though he may not always go the most um the most orthodox way Mm -hmm. there's definitely an added level of thought that he has to go through to get to the decision he wants to make it's not so cut and dry as it was in the book uh, where where the book was written for like you know young boys in colonial british rule and now it's 2012 maybe we got to change the story but the story of Treasure Island is just so unique that it's something you can retell and people can say, okay, well, at least we have this old story that we all know about people still not minding Ben Gunn. <laughs> oh, Ben Gunn. I want to see a miniseries about Ben Gunn. Did you know there's a novel about Ben Gunn? I didn't know yes. this. No. What? It's called The Adventures of Ben Gunn, and it was written in 1956. In 1956 by Delderfield. And apparently, I haven't read this book myself. I just found out about it today, actually, and I was kind of excited. Oh, cool. It's uh, Ben Gunn's life up to when he's de- he is marooned on the island and the three years he spends there and his time after he's found. So, But it's told by Jim Hawkins. So the voice is supposed to be similar to that of Treasure Island, but it's Ben Gunn's story. I wonder if the, uh, I wonder if the narrative is the same, like the, the, way, the way it's written. Yeah, I'm but I'm not sure. Basically what happens with narrative in the book is that it most of the story is told by Jim. Mm-hmm. But there's a there's a little chunk in the middle of the book that's actually told by the doctor. The narrative when Jim is talking is different than the narrative when the doctor is talking, meaning Stevenson wrote these two characters and wrote almost the entirety like the majority of the book as a character. And so you know how some authors will write and you'll be like, oh, this is a blank novel because it just sounds like something they would write. So Stevenson managed to write a lot of Jim as Jim and not as Robert Louis Stevenson, which I found neat. Like, for example, there are a lot more times where it says, like, it'll say the phrase, uh, you know, something said he when Jim is talking, whereas it won't say that a lot when the doctor is talking. So a little bit of differences there. I found that interesting. Yeah, the voices and also the dialogue's pretty fun because he uses a lot of, um, well, some some made up pirate slang, but also some words that were probably used by British naval officers and sailors um, that he would have heard. Yeah. And so you can definitely tell in the in the text when Long John Silver is talking as opposed to when Captain Smollett is talking, um, for example. But that just that just adds to the richness of the book and all those voices that there are included. I wonder why our ideal of pirates is Treasure Island. Like, do you think it's because it came first? It wasn't the first pirate book. It wasn't the first pirate movie. It wasn't the first, like, pirate radio show. But, I mean, it's the most popular of those three kind of things. Unless now 
Here's the thing. You ask somebody now, they're going to say Pirates of the Caribbean, aren't they? Right? Yeah, I think we like can Like, you're going to say name a, name a pirate narrative, name a pirate movie, and they're going to be like, oh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. Um, or as I say, I, I would think maybe prior to, when did Pirates come out? 2003 or something? I'd say maybe the, the reigning champion would be Treasure Island in a lot of people's minds. And uh, Gore Verbinski, who... The, and the director of um, Pirates of the Caribbean even said, like, flat out, he's, like, comparing himself to Treasure Island, and it's crazy because he has such a huge hold of fill. The thing is, like, that guy, like, he made a great movie. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What I'm trying to, I guess, get at is that even the pirates in Pirates of the Caribbean are extremely, like, based on the ideals presented in, like, Treasure Island, because real life piracy that, you know, we've been reading about wasn't really this kind of thing. I mean, pirates rarely murdered people. Well, at least not in the North Atlantic. Yeah. Um, But yeah, you're definitely right about Treasure Island influencing Pirates of the Caribbean and, and how it's almost not possible to write something about pirates in that kind of romantic way without looking to Treasure Island, because... It, it, there's only one treasure map that's ever been written historically by said pirates about buried treasure. So even though Treasure Island represents um, this idea, you're right, this cultural kind of construction about piracy, um, it's not that true to life. Like right. the golden age of piracy was like m- early to mid 1700s. And a lot of them were just um, privateers who had gone pirate or as they like to say, like an erring captain mm-hmm. was someone who would turn to piracy for um, taking cargo and ships for their own personal gain, as opposed to taking them for a particular country or for a particular navy, because there was lots of um, rivalry over who was going to get to colonize uh, North and South America and who owned the waters and um, who got those resources. So there, there were reasons that people became pirates, um, but many of them had short lives and did not save their treasure. And I think the miniseries that we were talking about earlier also touched on that because a lot of the pirates just um, throw their wealth away. But Long John's like, no, I save my money. I have a bank account. Like, I'm going to be a gentleman one day. And the gentlemen in the scene laugh at him. But I think that that's an interesting historical point that they're making there, that most pirates just left, just live day to day and didn't save treasure on buried on an island. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And you know what? Like, I'll give Pirates of the Caribbean this, that Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie, is based on Pirates of the Caribbean, the theme park ride at Disney, which was based on pirate myth, which was, you know, largely influenced by Treasure Island. So this is all coming back to Stevenson's great work here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Treasure Island is great. It's... He didn't he didn't write it in order to write a work of literature. He wrote it as a as a boy's adventure story. And I think that shows through. But he's still dealing with some of these themes. And I think they do transition over to a post-colonial world where we are where we're thinking about the world differently and about um, where that treasure is coming from and what it should be used for and those kind of things. But also the fact that he included a character such as Long John Silver, who's so morally ambiguous. Um, but is extremely charismatic and uh, has a lot of admirable qualities in, in him, but essentially is like a very dangerous person. Um, having a character like that in a boy's story was very unique, I think. There, there weren't many examples of that that I could think of in that, from that time period. Yeah. Because you're telling, you're telling boys, like young men, uh, a story about morality. Fiction was often seen as a way to uh, convey moral ideals and to teach boys how to act. And yet you have Long Done Silver as this charismatic character that people want to be like. So that's that's an interesting choice. And I think that that also lends to the book's longevity is that there are these kind of amb- ambiguous attitudes around morality and the way that Jim deals with some things is is not, like I was saying, like not very straightforward. Like he he runs off from the adults and he he goes and tries to, fix something himself and it ends up being one of the most intense things in the novel when he's trying to um fight off israel hands one of the pirates um who's 
um, tricked him and gotten a knife and is chasing him up one of these masts. And it's just so, so intense. And he gets stabbed and like he ends up having to shoot this pirate. And that violence is like part of that transition into manhood, even though it's not like, even though it's not something that um, Jim would have experienced if he had stayed in the stockade with everybody. But it ends up leading to their ability to fend off the pirates, find the treasure, and return home safely. Being written, being written in that time, in that era, and being around a bunch of other Victorian lit that was, you know, that was that had all these morals and things that people were reading, and and um, the, like the literature was was trying to to make a point with it. Do you feel like? Do you feel like? This book was unique enough. Um, like you said, he, he wasn't trying to make it for like a work of literature or anything like that. But I mean, he was up against contemporaries like Dickens. Both authors were pretty popular. Um, Charles Dickens, of course, his his work was extremely popular. Um, and some some might argue that it's the popularity of a piece of literature that will lead to its longevity because the more people who enjoy it and pass it on, the more people will continue to read it and find value in it. So I think for Treasure Island, um, it did capture a lot of people's imaginations. Otherwise, why would people still be making films, film adaptations? Or there was even a musical that was written um, that was that premiered in Edmonton in 1985 that was written by um, Jewel Stein. So why why else would this book be around other than it inspired um, a generation of people who then passed it on to their children and the next generation after that. So there were definitely things that were unique about that book, and there were definitely things that kept people thinking about it after so many years and kept it kept it moving through till today. Well, it's kind of like now. Um, I mean, when you look at what was happening in the world at that time, the British were still exploring the world. Like, that was happening during the writing. We just found the Franklin Expedition through the Northwest Passage. Like, that that's a big deal. Like Totally. Th- they, found, they found the ship that was from 1880-something, and it's, you know, frozen in ice. But that was happening during the time that this was written. Right. Yeah. Do you think video games such as uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag... Also nod towards Treasure Island in any way? Oh, I would definitely say so. I mean, one of the big parts of that game is that you have to go and look for buried treasure. And like you said, buried treasure didn't happen. Treasure Island basically made up that that happened and said pirates did this. And they went, oh, okay. Black Flag was in this new renaissance, if you will, of pirates. You know how we're, we're, we're always saying like zombies are, are having the thing and dinosaurs are having the thing. Pirates are also having their thing. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm largely going to say that's because of Pirates of the Caribbean because it was just so popular. I think there's another Pirates of the Caribbean movie coming out. Like, we're not we're not done with pirates. And you know what? I think that's really cool. When I was when I was in high school, like one of the big things was like, are you a pirate or are you a ninja? Yeah. For sure. And like it was just a silly, stupid thing. And you'd be like, pirates are ninjas. And people would say like, oh, I'm a ninja or I'm a pirate. I mean, I was always a pirate because... Pirates are awesome. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have to explain myself. <laughs> the, the romanticized version of pirates. From, Treasure, From Island. Treasure Island. Oh, a couple couple things, just a couple notes about Buried Treasure that I, I discovered. Um, one was there there is Oak Island, yeah. which is the only treasure map that we know of yep. in existence in Nova Scotia. And they're still trying to figure out. There's there's been all kinds of digs there, right? And trying to figure out w- what this treasure is and yep. what are all the what are all these booby traps and all these things. Um, but it's the only instance that I think we know of. Um, there was a treasure cache that was deposited on an island. I want to say off the coast of New York, um, but it was found almost immediately, and uh, it was taken taken by the court, I believe. At the time, so it, he he the the pirate didn't the pirates didn't intend to leave it there for a long period of time. It was just for safekeeping. So anyway, those those are the only two buried treasure instances I know of. Also, um, Edgar Allan Poe's stories were very popular as well, and he wrote one called The Gold Bug, which is about um, a treasure hunt. It's not to do with pirates necessarily, but he also wrote a, a story called um, 
a manuscript found in a bottle, and that's more of a kind of sea adventure story. So those two stories may have also influenced Stevenson because Edgar Allan Poe's stories were very influential and well known at that time as well. So, and finally, I mean, I like I grew up on the East Coast, and being there, like growing up and living in Nova Scotia, there, you know, you hear the stories, you hear those pirate stories. There's there's a well known ghost ship story in the Northumberland Strait that most people from Nova Scotia have heard, and there's a lot of stories about the piracy in in Halifax and uh, surrounding like Cape Breton. Um, like when you go down, when you go to Halifax, which everybody, you should visit Halifax. It's a beautiful place. But when you go there, you go to the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. Like they have, they have one of those pirate cages that they used to put prisoners in. Um, and they have the, uh, they have the, um, what did it say? Pirates be warned. The, the sign there with the, the hanging, the nooses. It's, um, and these these were things that actually happened. It's just part of, I guess, Nova Scotian or you know Eastern Can Eastern Canadian history. Um, tons of tons of places around there just were the classic pirate coves. I mean, Captain Keg came up to Nova Scotia a lot to do a bunch of things. Uh, Blackbeard, probably the most like famous actual living pirate, um, who was like you know. He was a menace and stuff. He did a lot of stuff up in Eastern Canada, like. But I feel like um, it's just really, really cool that that we get to share as Canadians in the overall history of these this wonderful like pirate genre of of things in the way of life. It's it's, it's awesome. So, Treasure Island is a great adventure story. Um, interesting commentary on uh, morality. And it's just fun. It's just a fun book to read. Oh, man. Really it's, it's... interesting characters, uh, really intense action, some funny parts. I mean, Ben Gunn just wants cheese. That's all he wants after three years alone on this island. He wants cheese. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I probably would want cheese, too. Today's harmonica segment is... What's your favorite sea shanty? Sea shanties? Yeah, this is out of left field, but you know what's just synonymous with like pirates and being on the ocean and being in sailboats? It's sea shanties. You can tweet that to us at Hardcover Radio. Hardcover is a thing because of you, the listener, as well as our supporters at Sea Jam, a nonprofit community radio station that provides stuff that's not available on mainstream media in the Windsor, Detroit area. We are here because of your generous support and donations, so thanks for listening. Next week, we're going to be talking about somebody we've been talking about a lot on this show. Because he's awesome. John Green. You can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Patreon, wherever you can find us, and you can always check out our website at hardcoverradio.com for more. Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Patreon.